Hello and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari. This is the Great Big History Podcast. In this episode, we talk about science. And science is a reaction to the violence of the Reformation. The Reformation is about belief. And we got the Inquisition. We got the wars of religion. We've got turmoil. 30 million people are going to die in over 100 years. All over belief, all over the basic statement that my understanding of God is better than your understanding of God. Not my God is better than your God. It's all the same God. It's my understanding is right and you're wrong. And science is an attempt to get beyond that because there is no way of proving whose version of God is right. So science wants to get to objective truth. What is the truth? So we can get beyond violence. And so it will use math as its language. Why? Because math is dispassionate. Two plus two is four. Nobody has ever, in all the math classes you have ever taken, gotten up in the middle and said, no, two plus two equals five. I'm right. You're wrong, teacher. Five. Two plus plus two equals five. Why? Why? Because one, math is boring. If there's one class you are going to be absolutely bored in, math class is going to be in that conversation. But that's why. I mean, math is not sexy. Physics could be sexy, the application. Engineering can be sexy. But basic arithmetic, cosines, sines, some algebra... Nobody is like, hey, um, look, I like you, you like me. How about we get together and study some calculus and make you plus me into an us? Nobody's doing that. Nobody's getting into fights in math class over two plus two equals five. It's dispassionate. It's right or it's wrong. Two plus two equals four. Or it doesn't. There is the part of me that goes, I would love that. Now, I do not teach math. But I have in the past had arguments with students who come in and they're like, you gave me a C and everything I said was right. And I'm like, well, actually, no, it's not right. It's we, we have to have this. No, well, I believe it's right. And I'm like, but yeah, your belief doesn't. But there's facts and there's ways of reading those facts. And meanwhile, there's not the same argument in math class. Hey, you marked me wrong for this question. Yes, because it's wrong. Why? 2 plus 2 equals 5. Actually, 2 plus 2 equals 4. Oh. Yeah. Like, and so math becomes the language of science because math is right or it's wrong. And it's you don't get into arguments about it. You can get into arguments over what the math means, sure, but not over the math. Do the math. It is what it is. The second thing is going to be the scientific theory. Okay, well, what are we, how are we going to, how is science going to act? Well, that becomes a scientific theory. It's right and it's verifiable. For science to be science, it has to be right 100% of the time. If it's only right 99% of the time, if it only comes out the same 99% of the time, it's something else. In the middle, in the 1500s, that would be magic. It'd be something else. For science to be science, it has to be right all the time. And it has to be verifiable. Other people have to be able to do the same experiment in the same way and get the same result. So science sets itself up from the very beginning as truth. Which is a problem. Which is an advantage. I should start, let's start with the advantage. Let's start with the advantage. Which is great. Because when it's right, it's right. And you don't argue with it. And that's what science wanted to be. The problem is, is there's a lot of parts of human knowledge that math can't solve. Try 
try as it might. So, what science does is take a look at traditions. Traditions might be wrong. When science starts out, it's starting out from, from zero, from the very start. So the first thing it does is do, do what teenagers do. Do what everybody does when, they, when they're starting to learn stuff. Go, what did someone teach me? Is it right? Traditions might be wrong. This is how you get books like history I didn't that history that no one taught me in history class. Well, because teaching third graders about the genocide of Native Americans just it's not what we want to do. And besides, we have the Thanksgiving story where white people and Native Americans are getting along. And so we're like, look, we'll just deal with that later. It's complicated. And so People will then go, oh, you lied to me. You lied to me in the fourth grade. It's like, no, you just, it's not that we lied, it's just we left out some of the more complicated stuff. Yeah, yeah. when we told you that um, your baby brother came from heaven, uh, that's not wrong. But it's more complicated than that. And when you were in the third grade, we couldn't tell you how complicated it was. Well, you lied. Not. And so science starts by looking at Aristotle, at the Bible, at the, at the classics, and says, what have we been taught and is that right? And so we get Galileo, who, who is going to investigate Aristotle. Especially the the, the heliocentric H E L I O centric version of the gal of the universe, that or the geocentric version of the gal. It's both, but it's Aristotle believed in the geocentric version of the universe. So I'm sorry about that for being confusing. That the universe revolves around the Earth. Galileo G A L I L E O G A L I L E O will argue that it's the earth spins around the sun, which is means helio H E L I O meaning sun, a uh, heliocentric version of the universe. Um, Darwin will, will look at Genesis. Now Darwin is a religious man. And but his investigation of um, natural selection and what becomes evolution is going to challenge the you know Genesis one Genesis two version of the Bible. Uh, Hook, H O O K E, is going to look at the, how the body works, and that's Galen, G A L E N. Galen's idea was that the body was composed of humors, made up of elements, and that. You got sick when they got, um, when those humors were imbalanced. And Hook is going to look at the body as kind of a machine. Look at all this stuff. Now, he'll have better technology than Galen did. But the idea is he's challenging Galen's ideas of the human body. So you start where the tradition was and go, is it right or is it wrong? You get new technology that allows them to do this. So you're like, well, why didn't they do this before? Well, because you didn't have this new technology. This new technology allows people to extend their senses. Hook is going to use the microscope to see red blood cells. And here's the amazing thing. Take a look at blood. Cut yourself. Don't cut yourself, please. But if you cut yourself, take a look at blood. What do you see? You see a liquid. It's a liquid. It flows. It flows out. It seeps. It comes out. It's a, obviously it's a liquid. Turns out when you look at it underneath the microscope, it's not a liquid. It's a solid. It's made up of millions and billions of solids, red blood cells. With the plasma in between to, to, to make it viscous, make it fluid. But your blood is actually millions and billions of red blood cells, solids. But if you look at it on your eye, come on, that's, that's not true. It's obviously false. I look at blood, it's obviously a liquid. Well, when you look at it underneath the microscope, suddenly it's different. 
Telescopes. Galileo is going to use a telescope to see the moons of Jupiter. Now, the moons of Jupiter are huge. Like, literally, they're huge. But they're huge because moons of Jupiter spin around Jupiter. They don't spin around the Earth. The idea was the universe turned around the Earth. Well, if the moons of Jupiter are spinning around Jupiter, they don't care about the Earth. They're not spinning around the Earth. So right from the start, without even talking about where the Earth is in the universe, we know that the geocentric version of the universe can't be right. So telescopes are going to allow you to see things that you can't see with the naked eye. The most spectacular stuff is supernovas, supernovas, the destruction of a star when a star explodes. Now, why does that matter? It matters because the idea of the universe is you looked up at the stars and said, nothing changes. They move, they spin, but that's because the universe spins around the earth. But all those stars have existed. All those stars will always exist. They've always been. And it turns out that when you get a telescope, you start to see nebula where stars are getting born. You see supernovas where stars are exploding and dying. You see that the universe, you see craters on the earth, on the moon. You can see the polar uh, ice caps on Mars expand and then shrink during the year. You see the, the giant hurricane on Jupiter. You can see that the universe changes. Where with the naked eye, looking up at the stars, it looks like it's always been that way. And it turns out that the universe is a living organism that's living and dying. And it's full of massive change. So just by being able to see new things, you're seeing, you, you, you see the world in a different lens, through a different prism. Science has to publish its results. It's got to share this stuff. See journals, books, Google. The idea is uh, you do an experiment, you find an answer, and then you share it with people. You don't keep it hidden. You don't, you don't um, lock it away in a patent somewhere that you share it so that other people can try to prove it. Because it does nobody any good if you keep the knowledge to yourself. The knowledge has to be debated. It has to be corrected. It has to, errors have to be found. Science must be provable 100% of the time. So you have to have venues to share. You not only do you have to have literacy, people read and write, you also have to have places. Universities will be the first major part, but other places will be invented too to share this knowledge, to debate it. So we'll get conferences and we'll get debate societies and we'll get places in the what's called the public sphere, books, journals, comments, uh, coffee shops, uh, clubs, where people will get together, have lectures. This is what I discovered. And other people will challenge that. Well, wait a minute. Or how does it deal with this? A PhD. So you write a book, but you don't get your PhD when you wrote a book. So I wrote a book. That's great. I got my PhD because I defended the theories in that book. We call it a defense. You sit there and I had five very smart people say, um, you're completely wrong. Prove to me you're not wrong in this way. And I had to defend my thing. And I would say something and they'd say, well, wait a minute, what about this? And I'd have to have an answer to that. And then somebody else would say, okay, that's talking about chapters one through three, but I got a question about chapter six. So let's talk about that. And it's, you had to do a defense. You had to defend your position. And that's science. That's, that's high end knowledge. Because if you can't defend it, if you can't make other people see the answers you see, then how good is that knowledge? It has to be right. It has to be provable. Um, that brings us to Newton. From 1642 to 1727, Newton is something different. 
there's Galileo and there's Copernicus and there's Tycho Brahe and there's there's the, those early scientists, but Newton is different. Newton is on a whole different level. Why? Because Newton is sexy. Newton is a celebrity. Newton makes science cool. He makes science sexy. People looked at Newton and said, I want to be like Newton. Where they maybe want to be like Galileo, and nobody's really going around saying, ooh, Copernicus, that's sexy. Like, you had to be an astronomy nerd to really like Copernicus. It's not that he had bad ideas. It's just he didn't, he wasn't a celebrity. Newton, Newton is a celebrity. Ordinary people knew who Newton was. Peter the Great, before he's the Great, because he's just Peter Romanov from Russia, comes to England and he wants to be shown around. And uh, the King of England says, well, I'm going to show you my, my, my navy and I'm going to show you my army. I'm going to show you all this awesome stuff. What would you like to see first? And Peter says, I want to meet that man, Newton. I want to meet that man, Newton. A university professor. Only this is, is a thinker. That's it. He made scientists into a celebrity, which means he made science cool. Two, he had a broad curiosity. He talks about every, he deals with everything. Calculus is the great example of this. Why? Because you hate calculus, and I understand. But calculus started as a drinking discussion. He's he's on uh, a holiday from the university, and he's sitting there, and he's having a beer with a friend, and the friend goes, look, Newton, you're a smart guy. Newton says, I know, I know. And the friend goes, we know the circle is the most perfect of most perfect of shapes. The Greeks tell us this. Aristotle tells us this. Plato tells us this. We know this. It's perfect. Why aren't planets orbits a circle? Why are they an ellipse? We know they're an ellipse. We know planets speed up and slow down. Why? And Union says, I don't freaking know. I have no idea. It should be a circle. Like, if God made it, it should be a circle. And everybody agrees God made the universe, so it should be a circle. So why is it in a circle? And he goes off to figure it out. And he figures it out. And he goes, ha-ha! It's gravity. How do I prove that it's gravity? And that's calculus. Calculus is the math he needed to invent in order to prove that planets orbit the sun in an ellipse and not a circle. That gravity has these effects. He uses a prism to see what happens with white light. And if you've ever looked at um, the Pink Floyd Dark Side of the Moon cover, you know what a prism does. It breaks up the spectrum of light. White light is actually not white. It's a multiple colors, not the lack of color. People, artists, thought white was the lack of color. And that's huge because it's going to change how art sees color. Because if you take all your colors and you mix them together, you don't get white. And yet, if you take the different spectrums and you mix it together, you get white light. And you go, wow. And the idea of this is it's going to change how art sees color. Artists are going to be like, whoa, that blows my mind. Now, what can I do with that? And what you're going to see in the 1700s are, and will lead into Impressionism in the 1800s is experimentation with color. Because what you see might not be what you see. And that's what the prism, that's the most important part of the prism. You go, well, why does this matter? It's because light looks like light. It's white. It's, it's you know, if you have a, some a warmish, lamp it looks you know, a little bit yellow and and that's what it is and it turns out it's not that at all what you see might not be what you see your blood may not is not a liquid it's a solid he comes up with momentum and gravity 
he basically will invent modern physics. It's called Newtonian physics is how it's physics for big objects. And the important thing about that is that it means the universe is predictable. You can predict how the universe works. And that's huge, huge, because it's these huge forces. But if you look at the, at the um, Pluto, the spaceship that went to Pluto was launched something like what, 12 years before it landed, it landed on Pluto. It passed by Pluto. So it means they had to be able to predict where Pluto would be in 12 years. How fast the ship would be moving. How fast Pluto is moving. Where is it going to be? Well, how did they do that? And they did it. They shot right by it. Got lots of pictures. It was huge. It's awesome. How did they do that? Newtonian physics. Universe is predictable. That Pluto is not going to just stop and put on the brakes. Why Newtonian physics is going to explain why things move and how they move and how they interact with each other. Those are our three laws of momentum, right? An object at rest will remain at rest. An object in motion will remain at motion. And everything has an equal and opposite reaction. That's explaining how the universe works very simply, very easily. The second part, part B of this, is that people can understand the universe. Like, you can understand calculus. You can learn science. You can read Newton. People can understand the universe, i.e. they can understand God. And that's huge, huge, because we just had 100 years of war debating that question. And here comes math. Here comes Newton saying in his Principia, the Principia Mathematica, the Principia, P-R-I-N-C-I-P-I-A, Principia, Mathematica, M-A-T-H-E-M-A-T-I-C-A, M-A-T-H-E-M-A-T-I-C-A. In his big book, the Ma Principia, Principia Mathematica, is that the universe is predictable, which means you can understand it. Now think about how crazy that is. It's the universe. God invented the universe. Can you know God's thoughts? No, of course not. So you are talking about, you can understand the universe, how the universe works. You can watch it. You can predict it. You have that humanist power. And that is the big success of science. Science, it does what the Reformation couldn't do. The Reformation starts with humanism. You are important. But it couldn't prove that you're important. It can argue for it. And it argues very well for it. But it can't prove it. Science can prove it. Because you can understand it. You can see the gears of the universe at work. You can see how God put the universe together. That will bring us to the enlightenment and the state of human nature. Because here's the thing. If I can understand the universe, how the universe works, how planets work, maybe I can understand something even more complicated, more crazy, more unpredictable. People and society. In our next episode, we talk about the enlightenment and the state of human nature. Thank you.